All right, so this is part two. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a phone call. It interrupted everything. Damn them. So, to continue, the minority or social model was introduced by Nancy Island into the field of disability theology. And this model, as Island defines it, quote, holds that the physical and psychological restrictions that people with disabilities face are primarily due to prejudice and social discrimination and only secondarily to the functional limitations or emotional disturbance related to our physical impairments. And she's only talking about physical disabilities in her book. Um, in other words, while physical or mental impairments do present genuine problems, absolutely genuine problems for disabled people, the hostility of the social and physical environment amplifies the distress attendant, attendant to the disability. Um, and you'll hear, you'll hear caricatures of the social or minority model saying that, oh, it, it only is thinking about social barriers that create disability and it ignores the actual impairment. But that's not true uh, because the social model is trying to hold these two elements in tension. Yes, there are social, socially created barriers and there's also genuine impairment that disabled people struggle with. And these two things taken together constitute the the disabling nature of disability. So the social model, according to Retief and Letzosa, understands disability as a socially constructed disadvantage brought about by various ableist social and environmental factors in society. So on this model, disabled people are a socially ostracized minority group. Iceland claims the lived experience of people with disabilities as the starting point for her theology of liberation. Just as Gustavo Gutierrez had done in relation to the poor, James Cohn in relation to black people, and Dolores Williams in relation to black women. So Iceland is responsible for transforming the minority group model of the belonging to the disability rights movement into a liberationist theology. So we've done the moral, economic, uh, medical, and social models. So what we got left, the, uh, the fifth major model that plays a role, um, a big role in theological reflection on disability today is Deborah Beth Creamer's limits model. Creamer moves beyond the medical and social models to elaborate her distinctive limits model of understanding disability. The limits model understands disability as, quote, an instantiation and reminder of human limits, unquote, rather than a personal deficit or impairment, as in the medical model, or as primarily constituted by experiences of discrimination, as in the minority model. So Creamer notes that the minority model does not actually offer a creative alternative to the medical model, but it simply opposes it by taking up a position on one side of the impairment discrimination binary. Is disability an impairment, or is it based on discrimination? Um, those are seen as the two choices in what Creamer believes to be the existing binary. <clears throat> and Creamer herself, you know, she thinks of herself as a binary buster. She wants to be cool. So she aims to transcend both the medical and minority models by redefining the deficits at the center 
of the medical model, not as a negative limitedness, but as a positive, or at least neutral, manifestation of limits that every human being eventually experiences. Or almost every human being. I mean, you could think of examples where somebody's in the prime of life and young and then all of a sudden they're hit by a train and they never really experience disability, but I hope nobody has had a loved one hit by a train because that would be a really bad example choice on my part. But, um, you know, something like that. Barring something like that happening, every, uh, you know, every person is going to um, <clears throat> eventually experience like limits, significant limits at some point in their lives. And you, you have limits right now. I mean, you're not unlimited. So, uh, Creamer she uses the a broader meaning of the word limits to include the limits identified in both the medical and minority models, um, thus synthesizing bodily and social limits as concerns within one model. Creamer's limits model consists of three primary claims with religious significance. First, limits are an unsurprising characteristic of humanity. Second, Limits are an intrinsic aspect of human existence. And three, created limits are good, or at the very least, not evil. Since God in Genesis 1 looked upon all creation and declared that it was good. Limitations are part of what it means to be a human being created in the image of God, created by God by the God who limited eternity into a time and space in which creatures can sojourn. And Creamer's limits model, it is thoroughgoingly theological. She asserts that since human beings created in the image of God have limits, you have to consider the implication of human limitations for the divine life. In what way um, do human beings in the image of God give some insight into God, God's self? <clears throat> Creamer, she considers it fitting and true to the Christian tradition that God has limits too. And this may sound crazy, but just wait. So, Creamer, she notes that God, quote, took limits willingly by creating or allowing free will, that is, setting a boundary within which God could not compel human agents, or by taking on personhood and death through Jesus, where enfleshment and finally death stand as the uh, ultimate limitation. So if you think about, you know, how do human limits reflect divine limits, you can see pretty clearly that it's not that God is limited by an external force, but God limits God's self to make space for human agency, human free will, human action. And God also limits God's self in taking on flesh, right? And the incarnation, according to like traditional Christian theology. <clears throat> so four, four further models of disability that I want to get to, that have thus far, I don't know, seem to be less prevalent, prevalent in the field of disability theology, are the identity model, human rights model cultural model and the charity model. So what are these? The identity model is also known as the affirmation model. 
It builds upon the social model's understanding that disability is socially constructed. But the identity model adds a positive affirmation of disabled identity. It reframes disability as an identity marker like gender, sexuality, race, or class. People with disabilities who have adopted the identity model have undertaken celebratory events like disability pride or like death pride parades, much in the same way that um, LGBTQIA plus people put on pride parades. Um, people with disabilities who have adopted the identity model when they put on these celebratory events, they offer a resounding affirmation of their dignity and their legitimacy as members of society, as valuable human beings worthy of respect. The human rights model of disability, like the identity model, builds upon the social model um, put forth by Iceland. Since the human rights model um, sees the social model as a critique-centered understanding of how social and environmental barriers disable people with disabilities, the human rights model envisions itself as offering something positive and constructive to the social model. The human rights model is distinct from the social model in that it, um, according to Retief and Litsosa, <clears throat> quote, moves beyond explanation, offering a theoretical framework for disability policy. Oh, I have a cat bothering me. Are you here to bother me? Yeah, she's sweet. This is Snickers. You've seen all the cats except Bebe in this video. Hey, Snickers. 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 See how sweet. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, according to Retief and Sosa, the human rights model is distinct from the social model because it, um, quote, moves beyond explanation offering a theoretical framework for disability policy that emphasizes the human dignity of people with disabilities and they also offer uh, and it also offers quote constructive proposals for improving the life situation of people with disabilities unquote so the human rights model seems to be more con concrete more policy oriented so while the identity and human rights models um, are both incredibly important to understanding disability, it's questionable that these models should be um, like Okay, so a fish is having a crisis. I, I gotta come back in part three.